Today is Daf Samche. We're going to start uh, at the very bottom, actually, of Samach Dalad Amud Bet, the very last line of that Amud, where the words say, Amar Rav Sheshet, Mishum Rabbi Elazar Ben Azaria. Rav Sheshet said in the name of Rabbi Elazar Ben Azaria. Now, on the previous Daf, the very last line. Yeah, the very last line. So, uh, in the pre- the previous daf talked about uh, one of the issues discussed on the on the previous daf was the um, you know wine drinking of wine. How a person who drinks wine can't be morehora. He's not allowed to answer questions of halacha. He can't uh, be involved in a bet din because he's not fully capable of doing so. So there was a discussion of this in the previous stuff. So that's why the issue of wine comes up. So Rav Sheshet says in the name of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, and we turn to Samachi Amud Aleph, I could potentially free the entire world from Hashem's judgment. In other words, I can make an argument that uh, everybody who does sins in this world is really exempt from punishment. How so? Miyom shaharav bet HaMikdash v'yad achshav from the day that the bit of, and my 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 uh, ability to free them from judgment would only apply from the time that the bit of Mikdash was destroyed until today. How so? Shine Emar, as it says, Lachen Shimina Zot Aniya Ushkurat Vilomiyain. Hear this poor one who is drunk but not from wine. What does it mean drunk but not from wine? It means that our the existence of the Jewish people uh after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, is like a state of drunkenness. Okay, shechurad v'lomiyayin means you're, you're acting drunk, but you didn't actually drink wine. So as uh, Rashi explains, shikurim, shikurim ve'en nitfasin al avonam. Because they're like drunkards, they aren't held responsible for what they do. So he's saying, because the Navi calls the Jewish people shechurad v'lomiyayin, you're drunk but not from wine, after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, that means that how can you hold them responsible for what they do? They're drunk. They're not in full possession of their faculties. They're not operating on the highest level. May to be there is an objection. Shikur mikchomekach o mimkaro mimkar. It says that when a drunk person makes a transaction, let's say he purchases something, he can't come back later and say, I was drunk, the purchase is not valid. If he sells you something, he can't come back later and say, I was drunk, the sale is not valid. Avar Averash Yeshba Mita, if he violates a capital offense and there are witnesses there and they warned him, Mimitinoto, we kill him. Malkot, if there's a if there are uh, uh, whipping involved, if it's a, if it's something for which the penalty is Malkot, so Malkinoto, then we whip him. So in other words, being drunk is not an excuse. Klaloshal Davar, Harei Hukapikeh Lhol Devarav. Ela Shepatur Minatefila. So he said the only thing he's exempt from is prayer, tefillah. But everything else, he's obligated in. He's responsible for his own actions. So how could Rav Sheshet say in the name of Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah that if we're all like drunkards when we're in the galut, when we're in the exile, that means that we're all exempt from any punishment. It's not true. You see that even in the Bedin Shalmata, even in this world, we say that a drunk person is fully responsible for everything that they do. So he answers, so the Gemara answers, What was it when he said, I'm capable, I could exempt everybody from the judgment by saying that we're all drunkards? What he meant was, he said, What he meant was that if Hashem judges the Jewish people for not praying, not praying enough, I'll say, we're all drunk, that's why we don't pray enough. Other mitzvot, it's true, you're responsible for your actions. We can't exempt everybody from responsibility for their actions. But to feel out, we're all exempt. This is only true if the person didn't reach. Shichruto shalot means they're so drunk that they have no idea what's going on. Like the way that Lot was with his daughters. But if a person reaches the drunkenness of Lot, that person is exempt from all the mitzvot because he's not capable of thinking straight anymore. So that certainly, if he makes a sale, if he buys something from someone who's higiel shichruto shalot, you know, it's nothing because he's not he's not even conscious of what's going on. Am Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Chanina says, Kolam mapik magen b'shat gava. 
Sogarin vechotmin tsarot ba'adom. So this is a very, very strange, weird, uh, ambiguous statement. So literally what it means is, anybody who... Uh, uh, so, I mean, you can't really understand it on a literal level, but it means anybody who uh, it leaves out the shield uh, at the time of arrogance... They close and seal trouble in front of him. But what does that mean? So Rashi explains. What does Hamapik Magen mean? Hamaavir Tefilat Magen Avraham Sheino Omra. Meaning he doesn't say the Amidah. He doesn't pray. Anybody who's Mapik Magen means he leaves out the Tefilah. He doesn't pray. Bishat Gava at the time of arrogance means Bishat Shechrut Eno Mitzpalel. So it's actually a good thing. What's it saying is what it's saying is anybody who doesn't pray at the time when they're drunk. In other words, he doesn't pray at an inappropriate time. So he does the right thing. He leaves out the prayer when he's not supposed to be saying it. So that person, so green v'chodmin tsarot ba'ado shelo yavo alav that he's protected from tsarot. He's protected from bad things happening to him. In other words, like just like we would say that a person. Uh, should pray when they're supposed to. If a person's not supposed to pray because they're drunk and he doesn't pray, that's also a mitzvah. That's also a good thing. And it shows something about him that he recognizes that tefillah can only be done when a person has full possession of their faculties. ga'ava afike maginim. So as it says in the Pasuk, that, uh, that ga'ava afike maginim sagur chotam tzad. Now this, again, this is a difficult pasuk to literally translate. But what they're saying is, they're interpreting it to mean, um, ga'ava, arrogance here is referring to a state of drunkenness. Afike maginim, people who take out the prayer, meaning they don't say the prayer because of that. So then, sagur chotam tsar, then sources of trouble are sealed and closed. Okay, are closed and sealed. So... Now the Gemara says, "My mashma da apik lishna da avurehu," and how do you know that the that the pasuk that afike means to get out, to to leave it out, to skip the prayer? How do we know that it means to skip? Because it says, "Ahe bagedu chemonachal ka afik nechalim yavoru," because it says that uh, because it uses the term afi. What? Yeah, this is from Eov. No, so, no, yeah, but uh, Tehillim, what, what uh, Shafiq can... Afikimayim. No, no, Afikimayim. Okay, Afikimayim, right? Nachal Achzab, that you have so much water, and then when you come, it does not, does not exist anymore. Mm-hmm. That's Nachal Achzab. No, okay, oh, because it's, it's right, because it, cause it goes back. Water, but then it dissipates. Then it's gone, Nachal right. Achzab. Right, so... Ka'afikim Banegev. So here it says, Ka'afik Nechalim Ya'avoru. Yeah. Okay, meaning it disappears. Right, it goes away. Exactly what you're saying, right. So it skip, it passes away. What? No, what's Rabbi No, said? he's saying it, it, it comes up, the water, and it looks like there's going to be a lot, and it subsides. Right, so, so it's saying Yavor, it goes away. Okay, so that's what we see. Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, Kol she'eno mapik itmar. What it says is, Kol she'eno mapik. Somebody who is not mapik. But he's actually saying the same thing, by the way. He's still saying that you shouldn't pray when you're drunk. But instead of mapik meaning to leave out the prayer or to skip the prayer, he's interpreting the word mapik as who expresses, to express words. So what he's saying is a person who doesn't express the prayer is right. So the previous version had somebody who's, who mapik is correct, meaning who skips it. He's saying, no, who doesn't mapik, because he's saying that mapik means to say it. And he's saying, you're not supposed to say it. So, dikhtiv, as it says, vayira'u afike ma'im, vayigalu mosedot tevel. Okay, because it says that the afike ma'im will be revealed. In other words, they're going to come out. The water is going to come out. It's going to be revealed. So, so too, somebody who doesn't express the prayer is right. Now, they're saying the same thing, right? One is just using the word mapik to mean skipping the prayer. So, he's saying that's what you're supposed to do. The other one is saying mapik means to let the words come out. So, saying not to be mapik is the thing to do. Because you don't want to say the prayer when you're drunk. But essentially, they're saying the same thing. So the Gemara says, So the Psukim support both interpretations, that apik can mean either to express, to reveal, or it can mean to skip something. So uh, that being the case, so my benayu, what's really the difference between the two interpretations? Why is one guy using the word mapik to mean skipping the prayer? One is using it to mean 
expressing the prayer. So it says, Ika benayu de Rav Sheshet. The distinction between them is the halacha of Rav Sheshet. The Rav Sheshet masar shinete l'shamae. Mar it le de Rav Sheshet, umar let le de Rav Sheshet. So Rav Sheshet used to tell, when, when Rav Sheshet had too much to drink, he would tell his attendant to wake him up for the prayers. So one says that that's, that's a good thing. In other words, in other words, uh, um, you know, it's better to Rabbi Hanina who says, you're supposed to skip the prayer if you're drunk, will say, don't tell your attendant to wake you up, just skip it. And Rabbi Yochanan will say, don't say the prayer if you're drunk. He would say, but if you can say the prayer, so if you can have your attendant wake you up, it's good to do it. You're not skipping it. In other words, it's a question of whether you're using the words, that the, you're saying a positive thing that you must skip. So if you must skip, then go to sleep and skip it. And you're showing kavod, you're showing respect to the prayer by skipping it. But according to Rabbi Yochanan, it's just that you can't say the prayer. But if you can tell your attendant to wake you up in a half hour and after taking a nap, you'll be able to say the prayer. So then it's good. Say it. So that's the difference between them. But essentially they agree, obviously, that you can't pray in a state of drunkenness. Rav Chiyabar Ashi said in the name of Rav, if a person's mind is not settled, he shouldn't pray. Because it says, It says, In trouble, don't, don't teach, don't instruct. Literally, that's what it means. So what it's saying is, don't, uh, and, and here we're using the word yore as, as a, a, in terms of tefillah. So, Rashi says, "Badakti achar mikra achar mikra has hamikra ze veino bechol haketuvim vesheba vesefer ben sirahu." He says, "I checked the entire Tanakh, and this pasuk of Batzar al Yored doesn't exist." So he says, "Maybe it's in another book. Maybe it's in the book of Ben Sirah. The book of Ben Sirah was a not part of the Tanakh, but it was commonly cited by the rabbis. So we don't know where this pasuk Batzar al Yored means. But liter- um, we don't know where it is, rather. But we know that Batzar al Yored means." That when you're in trouble, don't instruct. And tefillah is a type of instruction because it work. It comes from the word pelilim, judges. Okay, so so we don't want to be engaged in this kind of thing when our mind is troubled. Batzal, Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Chanina, biyomad deratach lo mitzale, amar batzal al yore ketiv. So on a day that he got angry, he wouldn't pray that day. He said because it says batzal al yore, and again this pasuk doesn't really exist in Tanakh. Mar ukba biyoma dishuta lo ava nafik lebedina. He on a day, mar ukba on a day that there was a southern wind blowing, which is, was a very strong wind. He wouldn't go out to the bedin. What was the reason? Because in that kind of weather condition, there was no way to be focused. There was no way to be able to judge properly. Amar of Nachman bar Yitzchak hilcheta baya ziluta kiyomad istena. That halakha, halakhic discussions require, tziluta, they require a clear mind. Like a day with a northern wind. Because a day with a northern wind was a refreshing, clear, sunny, beautiful day. Okay, so that's what the, uh, that's what the, uh, what, what, what the concept is here. So on a day where it's, there are disturbing weather conditions, and there's a hurricane going on, and there's rain, whatever, so people won't be able to focus on the same level. Um, and so Rashi explains, that a day where the northern wind blows, that's a day that's pleasant for everybody. And that's why the Jews didn't do the Brit Milah while they were wandering in the Midbar. That's why Yehoshua had to do uh, Brit Milah for them because while they were wandering in the Midbar, there was, there was no northern wind to make things pleasant so they wouldn't be able to recover from the uh, Brit Milah. So, um, so now Amar Abay Abay says, I amra liem karev kutcha lo tanae. So he says, if my mother would tell me, please bring me some dairy dip. Kutcha was kutach was this type of a dip that they would have. Yeah, kutcha bavli. Kutcha bavli is the is like a, yeah, it's like some kind of a, a yeah, some kind of a yogurt, some kind of a a dairy dip that they would dip their. Um, 
their uh, bread in or whatever. So even if my mother told me, bring me some kutach, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to learn with the same level of focus. In other words, even a little distraction can really take a toll on your learning. So he said, Rashi explains. What does he say? Lo he says, Lo shone I couldn't learn with the same level of focus and concentration because my mother distracted me by asking me to get her something, to get her some kutach. So the point is, you need really that silula, you need a very clear uh, mind to be able to learn. Amar Ravarava says, kina lo He says, if. My, if I'm bitten by, uh, by lice, I wouldn't be able to focus. In other words, if bugs start biting me, like sometimes you'll be outside at the park, you know, and you'll get those gnats and they start bothering you, or they start biting, they start, yeah, yeah, they're all over you. So he says, if, he says, if, I, if I'm being bitten by bugs, uh, I can't focus, I can't learn. He says, Mar, the son of Ravina, his mother made him seven different outfits for seven days. So each day he would wear a different outfit. So they would never get any lice or any kind of uh, bugs in them that would distract him and bother him during his learning. Amar Rav Yudah, Rav Yudah says, Lo ivrei leilia ele leshinta. Nighttime was created for sleeping. Amar Rav Yishimo ben Lakish, Lo ivrei sihara ele legirsa. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, no, the moon was created for learning. Why do you think there's light at night? If, the, if, the world, if nighttime was for sleeping... Then why would there be a moon? Everyone would go to better, bed better if there was no moon. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to do anything in the in the night. So Amre le Rabbi Zera. They said to Rabbi Zera, Mechadedan Shematach. They said to him, Your teaching is very clear. It's very it's very sharp. Amar the way said to them, Di Mameninu. That's because I learned during the daytime. If you learn during the daytime, it's more clear. There's actually a, a teshuvah from Rav Masas on this whole piece of Gemara on learning at night the, in uh, where he in Mayim Chaim Sefer Mayim Chaim he talks about uh, the importance of resting well and you know taking care of yourself and not staying up too late at night and he quotes this Gemara he says you see that the main learning is during the day don't uh, overstress yourself to lose sleep. Um, so the uh, daughter of Rav Chizda said to him, Don't you want to take a nap occasionally? You know, don't, don't you want to rest? You, you don't rest. You, you're, always, you're, you're always straining yourself. He said to him. He said to her, He says that the days will come that are long and short. And in those days, I'm going to sleep plenty. So what is he talking about? So Rashi explains, Yamim shehu bakever. Okay, I, one day I'm going to be in the grave. Arichei lishon, uktinei lasok batzav mitzvot. He says they're going to be long and short at the same time. They're going to be long because I'm going to have plenty of time to sleep, but short because I won't be able to do any Torah and, mit- Torah and mitzvot. Right? So, th- so I'm waiting for that time to sleep. I don't want to sleep now. If I sleep now, I'm wasting the time that I have. I'll sleep when I'm in the, in the grave. So that's what he said. So it's interesting. You see different, uh, it seems like different schools of thought here, right? Because some are saying, no, no, the nighttime is for sleeping. He says, no, no, no. Daytime is when you have the sharpest learning. No, no, nighttime, you don't want to waste your time. You got to stay up and learn at night. The, the, the moon was for learning. So the, um, so Rav Misas has a very nice take on this where he says that it specifically says, like girsa, for learning texts, Nighttime is good. In other words, if you're learning simple things, but if you strain your mind to get involved in the depths of things and you won't be able to sleep at night, that's not good. You know, it's, it, that your mind will be clearer during the day. So, We are day workers, day laborers, meaning the majority of our learning of Torah is during the daytime. Rav Achabar Yaakov Yazif Ufara. Rav Achabar Yaakov would borrow and pay back. What does it mean, Yazifu Farah? So Rashi explains, He would have a regimen of studying a certain amount each day. So what he would do was, some days he had too much going on at work, so he would complete his scheduled learning at night. So let's say he had three parakim to do. 
uh, that day he could only do two during the day because he was too busy with his work, so he would complete it at night. Now, isn't that interesting compared to the... Um, to the way things are done today, where there, you know, we, we have this belief that people shouldn't work at all and they should just learn all, all day long. This great chacham, he's working during the day, and when he can't, and when he can't finish his regimen of learning, does he decide not to work and not make the money that he needs? No, it's the opposite. He goes for the mizonot first, and then he makes it up, makes up the learning later. Because im in kemach in Torah. Okay. Now Amar Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer says, Haba min al. Oh, it's Elazar. I'm Rabbi Elazar. Abam in a derech al yit pal. You can't tell because it's Rish Aleph. Yes, sir. Abam Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar says Abam in a derech al yit palil shlosha yamim. If a person comes in from a long journey, he shouldn't pray for three days. Shene Emar, as it says, veek b'tzem el anahar. So because it says veek b'tzem el anahar abah el ahava. Right? Is it ahava or ahava? I can't tell. Yeah, it's a chet or it's a thing. Um, right, but it, the correct pasuk is with a hey, according to the according to the thing on the side. Yeah, it's ahava with a with a vav though. So it's a place. It's a it's a v'nachnu shav yamim shlosha v'avinu va'am. So he says that he, the, the v'nachnu sham right this is Ezra they came and they oh v'nachnu sham yamim shlosha and they they camped there for three days. And then I and then I started to uh, uh, to study with or to understand the people. Okay, so what it says is that uh, you see that he wasn't able to really study the situation to understand the situation until three days passed. So they came because they had a long journey and they came and they stayed at this certain river. Ezra says it was three days later that I really understood the situation. So he said they didn't have bina. He didn't have understanding. He wasn't able to comprehend. His mind was not fully settled for three days after they came to their place of rest. Um, when the father of Shmuel would come from a trip, he wouldn't pray for three days. Shmuel wouldn't pray in a house that had beer in it. What's the reason that he wouldn't pray in a house that had beer in it? Not because he wanted to drink the beer and he got distracted, but because the smell of the beer was very distracting and he wouldn't be able to focus. And Rav would not pray also in a place that had harsana, which was a certain type of fish that they would make. Yeah, a certain type of fish. I guess it was smelly also. That would smell good. You know, I guess their fish was like herring. It smelled bad. <laughs> If I, if I were in a room that smelled like herring, I wouldn't be able to pray either. It's too distracting. Uh, so I could understand that. He must have been, he was Sephardic. He, he didn't like the herring, so he, he couldn't, um, couldn't, couldn't pray. So the Rabbi Rechani, Rabbi Rechani says, Kolam mitpateh ben, uh, biyeno, yesh bo midat kono. That's a very interesting, it rhymes too. Kolam mitpateh biyeno, yesh bo midat kono. Anybody who is able to, uh, relax and be mitratzeh, uh, be uh, what's a word for that? To be pleasant, to be uh, conciliatory. When he has a little bit of wine, you take him out for a drink, and he's able to to be happy. So he says, "Yesh bomidat kono." That person is like Hashem. He's able to be able. He's able to be placated. It says, al davar So you could take a, a guy who's upset. You take him out for a drink, right? And all of a sudden, he's a happy guy. He says it's not such a bad midah. Some people just need something, you know. They put on some music, it can calm them. It's okay, as long as you have a way you can calm yourself, that's good. So where do we see that? Because it's Shneemar Vayarach Hashem et Because we see that in the case of Noach, when Noach brings the korban, Hashem smells, so to speak, the smell of the korban. And then he says, you know what, I'm not going to destroy the people anymore. So the, so the same thing, that something nice that brings nachat ruach, that brings a little bit of satisfaction to the person, and then they're able to look past other problems that they have. It's a good midah to have. To, you know, not everybody can bounce back right away, but if they're able to have a little bit of enjoyment, then they're able to get their mind off their troubles and to uh, forgive and forget. So anybody who's able to... Uh, drink wine without losing their minds. Okay, as it says, <speaking in Hebrew> that he's able to drink wine without his mind going bonkers. Some people, they drink a little bit of wine, 
and they become like a total clown. You know, in a short time, they become off the wall. But anybody whose mind is is preserved when they drink, that person has the the mind of the seventy elders. Yeshua dot in other words, the the Sanhedrin. He has like the Sanhedrin. How, Never. Yeah. Yeah. So it says, Yain nitan ba'ayin otiot, Vesod nitan ba'ayin otiot, Nechnas yain, Yatasod, or Yetesod, right? So it says that, um, that the, the gematria of yain is 70, right? So that's the same as the 70 elders of the Sanhedrin. It's also the same as the word sod, secret. So we know that the wine goes in, Yetesod, and the secret comes out. As Rashi says, So he's explaining, normally what happens when a person drinks wine is their secrets come out. The truth comes out. But this guy, even when he's drunk, the wine doesn't affect his mind. It doesn't, it doesn't mess him up. So therefore, since the secrets don't come out, even when he's drunk, he's like the Sanhedrin. Meaning he's, he's, a, he's a great chacham that even though wine would normally mean wine can either show that you're a great chacham because you don't let the secrets come out or it could show that you're a regular person because the secrets come out. Right? Kasod. I'm Rabbi Hanin. Rabbi Hanin said, Lo avelim, The only purpose of wine in this world was to comfort mourners and to give reward to bad people. Shine emar, as it says, because it says, give wine to the person who's lost, and and to the I'm sorry, beer or intoxicating drink to the person who's lost, and wine to the bitter of soul. In other words, the person who is suffering and is has suffered a loss, wine will help them, will comfort them, and a rasha gets his his uh, payback in this world. Okay, in other words, what, what benefit, what reward does the Rasha get in this world? He gets to enjoy wine. He doesn't get, so for whatever good things he's done, he gets his reward in this world, not the next world. So what kind of reward does he get? He gets to drink wine, enjoy good wine. That's all he can get. Now, Rabbi Hanin Bar Papa, Rabbi Hanin Bar Papa said, Kol nishpach betoch beto kamayim eno bracha. Anybody who doesn't have wine spilling in their house, like water, he doesn't have true blessing. Shinemar as it says, Right? It says, Hashem is going to bless your bread and your water. Just like it's talking about blessing in bread, which is something you can purchase with ma'aser. Remember, ma'aser sheni, you would take ma'aser sheni, money, right? You, well, you would take part of your produce for ma'aser sheni. And you're supposed to eat it in Jerusalem. But most people, what they would do was transfer the Kiddusha to money, take the money to Yerushalayim and buy food in Yerushalayim. And it was good for the economy in Yerushalayim too. So they would go and they would buy. They would buy. So what happens? You're only allowed to buy certain foods that are considered significant foods with that money, as we've learned before. So the person who brings the money and comes to purchase the food there, it says, just like bread is mentioned in the Pasuk, as something Hashem is going to bless you with, so too when it says water or liquid, it's talking about a liquid that you can purchase with the money of Maser. And what is that? It's calling it water, but really what does it mean? It really means wine, because you can't buy wine with the money of Maser. And this blessing is talking about blessing you in all the things that you're going to use for mitzvot like maser. So it calls the wine water. What does that show you? As we turn to Amud Bet, that if you treat wine, in other words, wine spills in your house like water, you're going to have a blessing, and if not, you won't. And that's part of the reason why people over, you know, they overflow the, the cup of Havdalah. To show that the, you know, many people, they overflow the cup on purpose. They overflow the cup of kos shel bracha all the time. To say that if wine is spilling in your house like water, you're, you're going to have bracha. Rabbi Eli, Rabbi Eli says, It's a famous saying. There are three ways you can tell a person. One is koso. How does he act when he's drunk? Im datom yushevet alavra, she says. If he's able to stay basically, he's able to hold his liquor and not go uh, crazy. That's what Rashi says, that it means if he deals with his money, 
It doesn't, it's not talking about how cheap he is. People think that kiso means how cheap you are. It means if he deals with money justly and ethically when it comes to money. And bekaasora, she says, sheno kapdan yoter midai, that he's not a temperamental person. That shows a good person, a person who is uh, able to hold his liquor, he is able to manage his money ethically, and he is not someone who flies off the handle and gets angry on a regular basis. Okay? Now we get back to some halakha here of Eruvain. Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, Yisrael ben Ochri ba'pnimit v'yisrael ba'chitzona. Ba'amah said lefnei Rebbe ve'asar v'lefnei Rebbe chiyav asar. So we have a situation where you have uh, a courtyard. This courtyard is closed on three sides and it's open on the fourth side. What is it open to? Another courtyard, which is also closed and open on its far side. So what happens is that in the inner courtyard, so the people who live in the inner courtyard have to go through the outer courtyard in order to get to the, to get to the public domain. Okay? So, what, so the people living in the inner courtyard are Yisrael v'nochri, a Jew and a non-Jew. In the outer courtyard is a Jew. Now remember, we learned the halacha, that in order to have an issue of Eru v'chatzerot, you need at least two Jews. Right? If one Jew lives in a courtyard by himself, he doesn't make Eruvei Chatzerot. So you need two Jews. If there's one Jew and one non-Jew living in a courtyard, or if it's all non-Jews and just one Jew, there's no Eruvei Chatzerot. You only have Eruvei Chatzerot because we follow Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. There's only Eruvei Chatzerot in a case where the Eruv is, I'm sorry, where, the, where, there's, where there's at least two Jews living with one non-Jew. So the question here is, you have this, and there's a picture here, it's uh, illustration number 231. You have a situation where you have an inner courtyard and an outer courtyard. So the inner courtyard is here, and you have a Jew and a non-Jew. So by themselves, would they need an Erov Echatzerot? No, because just a Jew and a non-Jew. Now what about the Israel here? This Israel, with this Israel, you could say, well, now we have two Israelim. And one non-Jew. So what do we need to do? The two Yisraelim need to make an Eruvei Chatzerot. And you need to rent the space. Remember, you have to rent the space now from the non-Jew. If there's just one Jew and one non-Jew, that nothing has to be done. So if you were just to look at this courtyard, you would need nothing. But since you have the extra Jew on the outside, and we know that in order to get out of here, they have to go through that Jew's courtyard. So really, they're all sharing this space. The outer space, they're all sharing. Because they're all going to pass through there. So it's all one System. It's all one entity. So therefore, you're going to need an Eruv Echatzerot, and you're going to need to rent from the Nanju. That's why it says, Rebbe prohibited, Rebbe Chia prohibited, meaning he prohibited them to carry in the Chatzer until they make Eruv Echatzerot, and also they rent the space from the Nanju. Now, two of Rabbi, Rav Yosef, Rabbi, and Rav Yosef were sitting at the end of the Shi'ur that was given by Rav Sheshet. Rav Sheshet and Rav Sheshet sat down and said, Keman Amar al Rav Lishmate. This teaching about the inner courtyard and the outer courtyard, who was it following? Ki Rebbe Meir. It must be following Rebbe Meir. And Kirkesh Rabat Reshe. And Rabat nodded his head in agreement. Now, why would he think that it follows Rebbe Meir? Because Rebbe Meir had said that even a Jew and a non Jew living in a courtyard, one non-Jew and one Jew have to the Jew has to rent from the non-Jew in other words there's no situation so according to Rav Yosef and Rav Sheshet we're not looking at it that the person in the outer that the Jew in the outer courtyard is combining with the Jew in the inner courtyard we're just looking at the Jew and the non-Jew together and saying you need to do something about this even just one Jew with one non-Jew is a problem who, who says that only Rabbi Meir so it must be following Rabbi Meir. Even though the halacha follows, not Rabbi Meir, the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, that you need at least two Jews to be sharing the space with the non-Jew. Amar Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef says, Are you kidding me? Would two great rabbis make a mistake about such a thing? How could you make a mistake about this? And think that this halacha is following Rabbi Meir. Iker Rabbi Meir lama li According to you, the case makes no sense. Because the case is a case where a Jew and a non-Jew are in the inner courtyard, and there's a Jew in the outer courtyard. But according to Rabbi Meir, even without the Jew in the outer courtyard, you have the same case. Because he holds that one Jew and one non-Jew would have to work something out. The Jew would have to rent from the non-Jew. So why do you need a case where there's a Jew in the outer courtyard? What, what sense does that make? And maybe you'll tell me that's just the way it was. That was just the case. 
Okay, in other words, it just happened to be that there was a Jew in the outer courtyard, but that wasn't actually relevant to the case. That was just a case. They asked Rav, Because they, they asked Rav. It's not true that the guy on the outside is dispensable. It's not true. Because they asked Rav, what about inside the inner courtyard alone? What would the halacha be? Okay? In other words, um, in, inside that, bechatzera penimit. In other words, if they're not going to go out into the outer courtyard where the other Jew is living, the Jew and the non Jew are in the inner courtyard. They don't want to go carry anything into the outer courtyard. They just want to carry in their own courtyard. Is it okay? And Rob said, yes. So what does that mean? Is he holding like Rebbe Meir? No, because he's saying that since it's only one Jew and one non Jew, it's no problem. So, in fact, the guy in the outer courtyard is very significant. He's the one creating the problem, because he's the second Jew. So, therefore, we must conclude that we're not following Rebbe Meir. So, Rebbe, then it must be like Rebbe Eliezer ben Yaakov, who says you need two Jews. And once you have two Jews, now you have an obligation of Erev Echatzerot, and you have to deal with the non-Jew and, and rent from the non-Jew. But the problem is that Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says that those two Jews only create a problem if they interfere with one another. And you just said that within the inner courtyard, does the outside Jew affect the inner courtyard? No, because he doesn't have to go through the inner courtyard. Why would he want to go into the inner courtyard? He doesn't need to. It's like a dead end. The inner courtyard is a dead end. There's no pur- purpose in going there. The outer courtyard is the passage for the people in the dead end to get out. So they have to go through the outer courtyard. So the whole issue here is the outer courtyard, not the inner. The inner by itself would be fine. Because the guy who lives in the outer courtyard is not going to come into the dead end. But the Jew and the non-Jew living in the dead end, living in that inner courtyard, they don't have to do anything. They only have to do something if, you know, with regard to the outer courtyard. So Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov then also would say this is not a problem. Because he only says if they're osrin ze al ze, if they interfere with one another. Here they're not interfering with one another. Because the guy in the outside doesn't affect the guy in the inside. This is what Rashi says. That since the person on the inside can move around in his courtyard with no problem, the fact that he can pass through the outer courtyard doesn't affect the guy in the outside. It's not going to force the guy in the outside to make an eruv. He's fine. He has no problem. So since Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov holds that, that means that this shouldn't be a problem either. So according to Rabbi Meir, even just one Jew and one non-Jew is going to be a problem. According to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, this situation shouldn't be a problem. Because since the person on the in, in the inner courtyard doesn't, um, you know, can be separate, can be seen separately from the person in the outer courtyard, even though he walks through the outer courtyard, it's no problem. They're still two separate courtyards. They don't need to make an eruv together. He, de- he wouldn't normally. Well, they wouldn't prohibit each other because simply passage is insignificant. Passage is not significant according to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. They're not all living in the same chatzer. The fact that... Right. The fact that you use that courtyard to get out doesn't mean that you're all part of one courtyard according to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Okay? That's the question. The question is, if, if I live in a dead end, and I can only get out, let's say, my development, like in, in uh, Bloomingdale Court, I can only get out if I go to, to Sugarbush. I can't get out from Bloomingdale. It's a dead end. It doesn't go out. Right? So, so I need Sugarbush, but Sugarbush doesn't need me. Right? This, nobody's going to come into my street to get anywhere. So that doesn't mean, though, that we're all automatically combined. That's what he's saying. It doesn't mean you're combined just because you need to go through the outer courtyard to get out. That doesn't mean it's combined. So the, um, so the, so therefore, like Rabbi Akiva, the regular muter bim koma usere chelo bim koma. Rather, we're going to say, like Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said that if I need, even though in my inner courtyard I'm fine, if I need to go out through the outer courtyard, now I'm going to prohibit the outer courtyard. The guy in the outer courtyard loses. Because since I'm going to use it, he's not going to use mine, but I'm going to use his. So I can walk around and carry things in my courtyard because nobody bothers me. But I'm bothering him because I'm going to pass through his courtyard. That means I share his courtyard because I use it as passage. So it's going to mess him up. 
So then, lama li nochri afilu Yisrael nami. But if that's the case, then why does the why does is the case with a non-Jew? What does the non-Jew have to do with it? Even if you had a Jew living in the inner courtyard by himself, and a Jew living in the outer courtyard, we would have the same issue that the Jew in the inner courtyard is considered a free agent; he can do whatever he wants. But the outer courtyard is shared. Because the Jew living in the inside is going to have to walk through the outer courtyard to get out. So the guy in the outer courtyard now can't use his chater. Unless he makes an eruv with the guy in the inner courtyard. But the guy in the inner courtyard doesn't need to. To carry in his own courtyard. In his own courtyard he's good. Because his own courtyard is, is fine. So now we say like this. Rather. Amar, so we have to solve it. So Amar Rav Hunah, Rav Yoshua, Rav Hunah, the son of Rav Yoshua said, "Le'olam k'Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov k'Rabbi Akiva v'Achab b'Maya Askinan k'Gon she'Erevu." What we need to do is combine two things here. What do we need to combine? We need to combine the halacha of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov with the halacha of Rabbi Akiva. So on one hand, we're holding like Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov that you only have, okay, a problem of Eruvei Chaterot when you have two Jews, at least two Jews living with an Anjou. And in this case, uh, we have two Jews involved in the case, right? And we're holding like Rabbi Akiva who says that even though in the inner courtyard the guy is okay because it's just the Jew and the non-Jew, they're fine. Since the Jew is going to pass through the outer courtyard, he creates a problem for the outer courtyard that it's considered inhabited by two Jews because the guy on the inside is going to always pass through the outside. So what's the issue then? And the whole issue revolves around the non-Jew. Why? Because this Jew that lives in the inner courtyard and the Jew that lives in the outer courtyard made an Eruv together. Why did they make an Eruv? Because the guy in the inner courtyard might be fine. But the guy in the outer courtyard is considered to be dwelling in a courtyard that's owned by two. Because the guy in the inside is going to pass through it. So they made an Eruv. But there's only one problem. A non-Jew lives in the inner courtyard too. And since a non-Jew lives in the inner courtyard, now you have to rent from the, inner, from the non-Jew in the inner courtyard as well. So this is true even according to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, that their two Jews are considered to be living in some sense together. So therefore, there is an obligation of Eruvei Chatzerot, at least for the benefit of the guy on the outside. And once there's an, a concept of Eruvei Chatzerot, at least for the guy on the outside, the, the non-Jew who's on the inside is also going to become an issue. Okay, so that's the, that's the way that they work it out. So now the Gemara says, Ba'amine Rabbi Eliezer me Rav. So Rabbi Eliezer asked Rav a question. And according to the side, it should be Rabbi Elazar again. So Rabbi Elazar asked a question from Rav. Let's reverse the situation. What if the non-Jew and Jew are living in the outer courtyard? And the Jew is living by himself in the inner courtyard. So what's the halacha then? So what's the issue? The question is like this. What did we say earlier? We said, why does Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov require that two Jews live in the courtyard with the non-Jew. In other words, if a Jew and a non-Jew live alone in a courtyard, there's no obligation of Eruvei Chatzerot, and there's no requirement that the Jew rent space from the non-Jew. They can just carry in the courtyard, it's no problem. But if you have two Jews, now you have a problem. What was the reason we said yesterday, or we said a couple days ago in the daf? The reason is because it's lo shichiach. It's not common for a Jew to live alone with a non-Jew in a courtyard with nobody else. It's only common for more than one Jew. Basically, what was the purpose? The purpose behind the halakha was they wanted to discourage Jews from living in the same courtyard as a non-Jew. But they said, one Jew living with a non-Jew, it's not going to happen. Why? Because you're going to be afraid that the non-Jew is going to hurt you, especially back then. That was a concern. So what about, so we said that if that a non-Jew and a Jew will live in the same courtyard alone in a case where the Jew is on the outside, Right In this situation, the Jew and the non-Jew are living in the inside courtyard, and the Jew is on the outside. Why? Because, let's say the Jew, because the non-Jew will be afraid to do anything bad to the Jew. Why? Because the, because the Jew on the outside of the courtyard is going to come visit the Jew on the inside and say, hey, where's my friend? And what's the non-Jew going to say? Your friend moved out? If my friend had moved out, I would have seen him move out because I live in the outside courtyard. How did he get out without me seeing the moving truck, you know? I didn't see anything. 
So that's why here we can have an idea of Eruvei Chatzerot with the one non-Jew because it's common for the Jew to live in a situation like that. But what if it's reversed? If the Jew and the non-Jew live on the outside, so then the Jew from the in and the Jew only is on the inside. So the Jew on the inside will pass through and say, hey, what happened to the Jew who was living here? And really the non-Jew killed him, right? But he'll say, no, uh, he, he moved out. You didn't notice because you live on the inside. You haven't come to, you know, you, you didn't see. So maybe we'll say that a Jew won't live with a non-Jew in a case like that in a courtyard alone because he's going to be afraid. Or maybe we would say, maybe we would say that no. Actually, even there, he's going to, the non-Jew is going to be afraid to harm the Jew. Why? Because since he's in the outer courtyard and the guy on the inside passes through, maybe he's going to walk in and see him killing him or beating him or something. So he's afraid to be caught. Now, why is this significant? It's significant because of a counterintuitive reason. That if we say that a Jew will not live with a non-Jew alone in a courtyard when it's on the outside. Why? Because the non-Jew can cover up and say that the Jew moved out and you didn't notice and really buried him under his uh, house or something like that, right? And he covered up the evidence and the guy living on the inside didn't know. So you might say that since it's uncom because a Jew won't live with a non-Jew in the outer courtyard because he's afraid there's nobody who's going to catch this non-Jew who's going to hurt me. So therefore, what would we say? There's no obligation to rent from the non-Jew because since it's an unusual case, in unusual cases, we don't impose the halakha. So even though this Jew is doing something crazy, he's doing something unusual, living with the non-Jew in a dangerous situation, precisely because it's crazy and unusual, the halakha doesn't apply. Right? Just like a Jew living in a totally non-Jewish courtyard, the halakha doesn't apply because it's so unusual. But if you say that it's also usual for a Jew to live with the one non-Jew in the outer courtyard because he relies on the fact that there's a Jew living in the inner courtyard and that that Jew might walk through, that the non-Jew is going to be afraid to harm him because the, non- the Jew might walk out at any time. So therefore, he will have to rent from the non-Jew because it's normal for a person to live with a non-Jew in that case. So the question is, do we consider it within the realm of normality to live in a situation where there's an inner courtyard and an outer courtyard, to live in the outer courtyard with a single Jew and a single non-Jew, if you know that there's a Jew living in the inner courtyard? That's the question. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not surprising. Okay. So now, so he answered him, Amarle ten kam od. Give to a wise person, he'll become wiser. What does this mean? It means, yes, in both cases, it's prohibited because both cases would be normal. In other words, whether the Jew and the non Jew are living together in the inner courtyard and the Jew is on the outside, or vice versa, that the Jew and the non-Jew are living in the outer courtyard and the Jew is in the inner courtyard. In both cases, it's a normal situation because since there's a third party involved, the non-Jew is not going to do any funny business. So it's considered a situation that's within the range of, range of normal. And since it's within the range of normal, that means that you have to rent from the non-Jew because it's something that the Gezerah will apply to. Reish Lakish would tell me that Rabbi Hanina ikle ulahahu pundak Resh Lakish and the students of Rabbi Hanina came to a certain inn. So the, the inn that they had was a rental. Okay? The landlord was there. In other words, the person who actually, the non Jew who actually lived in the inn wasn't around. But the landlord of the inn was around. So in other words, it would be like the person who ran the inn actually was renting the, spa- renting the premises or whatever it is, but the landlord, who was the actual owner, was there. So the question is, now normally, when the non-Jew is not around on Shabbat, we say, you can make an Eruvei Chatzerot, the non-Jew is not around. You don't have to rent from him when he's not around. Remember that? We learned that already. So, so he's not around, so we shouldn't have to rent. Okay? So the, the question is, though, what if he's going to come on Shabbat? He's going to show up on Shabbat. And he's going to ruin our Eruv. We have a problem. So we want to know, can we rent from the landlord? The landlord doesn't actually possess it right now because he rented it out to, this, to the renter. But the landlord has power over it. He ultimately owns it. So sh- can we rent from him? So Amru Ma'ul Lemegar Mine. Can we rent from the landlord? We understand, if the, if the landlord had no power to evict the tenant, 
then of course he has no power. He can't rent it. However, the lo agrina. We know that we can't rent in that case. Kiti ba'u hechad dematzei misalekle. But in a case where he can evict, so he has power. My keva dematzei misalek agrina odil mahashda miha halo salke. So do we say since the landlord has the power to kick out the tenant, therefore he can also rent it on his behalf? To us for Shabbat use. Now, is it a real rental? Not a real rental. It's a symbolic rental, so that we can incorporate the pro- the rights of the non-Jew to that area into our eruv. So it's a symbolic rental. So can, does the landlord have the power? Since he has the power to evict, is that enough power that he can also represent him and rent to us the space, so that we can now make an eruv or not? So Amar Lehen Reish Lakish Reish Lakish says Niskor Lukish Nagia Etzor Rabotenu Sheba Darom Nishal Lehen. So he said, you know what? Since we're not sure, and it's a Safek de Rabbanan, it's a rabbinic enactment. This whole idea of renting from the non-Jew so that you can make an Eruv Echatzerot without having to factor him in, that is only a rabbinic enactment, and Eruv Echatzerot altogether is rabbinic. So since we're not sure whether we're able to rent from this landlord or not, we should do it. We can rely on the Tzafek de Rabbanan. And when we get to the south, we'll ask our teachers whether we did the right thing. They came and they asked Rav Afes afterwards. Amar Lani said, You did the right thing. You can rent. Since he has the power to evict, he also has the power to rent it symbolically to you for the purposes of Shabbat. Rabbi Hanina Bar Yosef, Rabbi Chaya Bar Abba, Rabbi Asi. Once Rabbi Hanina Bar Yosef and Rabbi Chaya Bar Abba and Rabbi Asi, they came to an inn. And the thing was that the guy who owned it wasn't there on Erev Shabbat, but he was going to come on Shabbat. So what was the question? Can we... I'm sorry, can we rent the space from him? So the question is, right? So the question is, can you... Is renting like making an eruv? So the question's like this. Do we say that the rental that you do from the non-Jew, now remember, whenever Jews live together and there's one, there are non-Jews around, really, halachically, they would be able to make an Eruv Echatzerot because they don't have to factor in the non-Jews. The non-Jews are simply, they don't count towards the Eruv because they're not involved in Eruv. But the rabbis made an enactment that you have to rent their rights to the shared space. You want to allow yourself to carry in the shared space, the Chatzer, the courtyard. So you have to rent from them. Okay, so the question here is, do you, does the rental have to take place before Shabbat? So let's say we made an Erov Echatzerot, and the non-Jew shows up on Shabbat itself. So now we want to rent from him. Now we can't give him money to rent, but you can give him any object of value to rent. So can we rent from him on Shabbat? Do we say that the rental has to take place before Shabbat because it's just like Eruv Echatzerot, just like the Eruv itself, if they bring the bread together to make the Eruv so that they can all carry in the courtyard, that must be done before Shabbat, so too the rental has to be done before Shabbat. Or no, it's like Bitul Rishut, to remember the other way that you can get out of the problem that there are multiple owners or multiple users of an area is Bitul Rishut. Everybody can go to one person, everybody goes to Bob and says, Bob, we all give you our rights to this shared space. And therefore, at least Bob now has the ability to carry in and out of his house and so on, if, and in and out of the courtyard on Shabbat. Okay? That you can do even on Shabbat itself. Even on Shabbat, they can all come to him and say, we are giving you our rights, and then he can come back and give someone else his rights, even on Shabbat. You can move the rights around, because you're not creating anything, you're just giving up. You're just giving up your rights. So you're making it belong to one person because you're, everyone is giving it to the one guy. So they asked, what is the sechirut like? Can you rent from the non-Jew on Shabbat? Obviously not with money, by giving him something else or not. Is it like Eruv or is it like Bitul Rishut because you're just getting him out of the picture. You're factoring him out. So the answer is, what did they do? Rabbi Hanina Bar Yosef Amar Niskor. Rabbi Hanina Bar Yosef said, let's rent it out. 
Rabbi Asi, Amar lo niskorn. Rabbi Asi says you can't. Amar lo Rabbi Chaya bar Abbas. Rabbi Chaya bar Abbas said I'm going to make a compromise. Nis mochal divrei zaken v'niskor. Let's rely on the lenient opinion. So the three rabbis, one said we should do it. We can do it even on Shabbat. One said you can only do it before Shabbat. The third one said I don't know which one is right. Let's rely on the one who's lenient of the two of you, since it's only the Rabbanan anyway, and we'll find out later. So atu shailu leil Rabbi Yochanan. Later on they went to Rabbi Yochanan and asked him. Amar he said to them yafe. So later on he said, you did the right thing. You're allowed to rent from the non-Jew even on Shabbat since it's only a symbolic rental that enables them then to, uh, to carry within the chatzer, to uh, remove him from the picture and to carry within the chatzer. So therefore you're allowed to do it even on Shabbat. Now incidentally, it doesn't work that they made an Eruvei Chatzerot before. Once the non-Jew shows up, that Eruvei Chatzerot is canceled. But what can they do now? They can rent from the non-Jew and then they can do the bitul reshut. Then they can, all of them can go to the one guy and say, we give you our rights to the chatzer and we want you to carry the stuff in and out of your house and then he can come back and give back to them so they can switch back and forth amongst them through the rest of that Shabbat. But if they had the non-Jew there without renting from him, they wouldn't have been able to do anything. Have a great day.